I'd like to introduce my guests, starting with those joining, joining online. So, uh, Jesper Kalvaliho uh, Andersen, he's uh, an investor and a serial entrepreneur with a lot of um, mergers, acquisitions, uh, turnarounds under his belt. So um, I'm really keen to hear how fintech industry looks like in the eyes of the investor. Uh, then we have Douglas McKenzie, who is a serious producer and host at Fintech Finance. So Douglas writes or actually shoots <laughs> videos about fintechs and does a lot of top-level executive interviews. So who else, if not Douglas, knows everything what's there to know about fintechs from a holistic perspective? And I, I'm really looking forward to hear your observations today. Then in the studio with me, we have Vito Toskaralevicius, who is a, a co-founder of a number of companies, Bankera, I would say Digital Challenger Bank, uh, SpectroCoin, uh, which is a cryptocurrency exchange, uh, licensed electronic money institution, Tervask. And recently, Bankera has won uh, one of the six categories in the hackathon organized by European Commission, EU versus Crisis, with uh, their funding solution for SME. So I'm sure that Vito does, will tell more, more about the solution uh, for us today. And Kestutis Gargiulis, who is the founder and chief innovation officer of um, award-winning financial uh, software company Atronica, most famous, I guess, for your omni-channel banking solution and, and loans origination system. And I know that you are very keen observer of uh, fintech industry trends, so very much looking forward to hear your views. So without further ado, let me start. And I'd like to kick off with the kind of warm-up question. Uh, Before the crisis, I guess it was kind of common belief that fintechs are kind of more flexible, more adaptable, uh, quicker to adjust to different uh, situations in the market to shift their business models. Now, looking back into the COVID-19 crisis, would you say that that's the, that's the truth? That's, that's the fact which we could uh, confirm? Maybe I'd like to direct this question to Jesper in the very beginning. Thank you, uh, and thank you for allowing me to be here. I think it's a, it's an excellent question because uh, in these uh, in these complex times where we all face uh, limitations, uh, new limitations on a daily level, um, the digitization of the world has definitely given a an incredible opportunity for, for fintech um, in comparison to the banks. Uh, I think, uh, yes, the answer uh, is um, yes to your question. I think uh, fintech in, in many ways, in many situations, has taken this opportunity, has proven that they, they're ready for it. Um, uh, and especially, uh, it's always easier with a good comparison because uh, we have over these last three months seen the panic um, uh, within the traditional banking sector um, and, and, and seen the bank really abuse situations, especially for SMEs, um, where uh, they have suddenly come out and questioned long-standing loans and asking people uh, uh, for uh, written responses to how are you going to recover uh, your, your, your current losses. And um, this is at a point where nobody really knew what was going to uh, tomorrow. Nobody knew when the lockdown would be open. Nobody knew what was going to happen next. So I think uh, in between the two, you know, that we have on one side uh, the fintechs that is uh, born as a digital entity and the traditional banks that just uh, did not react well to, um, to this situation. Vito, would you agree? And also maybe now it's a good opportunity for you to comment on your solution, what you have developed during the hackathon. So yes, I would agree, but also I think like 
in general, there was not so much innovation during the lockdown because it was too short. And for innovation, especially in finance and technology to happen, you need more than three or two months. But I think the fintech, as we know it, not like, because fintech is a very wide area, but like fintech, as we know it about the business who are facing the clients online and they avoid the brick and mortar uh, chains and so on. Uh, they actually, they already prepared for the kind of a lockdown scenario when people don't need to have a physical presence, they don't need to visit a branch, they don't need to use cash. And I think it was a great kind of like a great adoption of fintech solutions in general market, as before e-commerce and so on, so on. Uh, and I would actually like, like to comment on the point about the, that SMEs were left, were left over from the, from the government support, because, and especially the SMEs who were not leveraged extremely well. Mm -hmm. Because, because uh, like if you look at the, all the most of the stimulus packages to help society, uh, economists to survive their uh, lo lockdown, it was more or less given to prolong the existing, uh, outstanding debt obligations, uh, like not to help, like, and also help the banks to actually not to have like a bad debts at least for the next six or three months. And actually, the companies who actually were not were not leveraged, were not didn't get like the outstanding debt, they actually fell, uh, were hit the hardest because now it's very hard to get a new loan because the financial institutions are neglecting to get a loan. And I think that's the place where fintechs can come in and actually coming in. Uh, despite from our solution, we also like solutions when people are issuing their prepaid vouchers online on the fintech platforms, then you can actually come back to the restaurant or bar later on and use that voucher to to buy a drink while giving the cash now like uh, now and we, are, we also looked from Bankera side we also looked for a similar solution so we wanted actually to fix the potential breakdown of a supply chain at the earliest phase where the retailer is actually not able to pay the suppliers and the suppliers are not in the motivation to do that but we cannot give a, provide a cash to them because they also like a short of cash so we should we develop a solution when we issue the loans by the guarantee of both the supplier and the buyer trying to fix the supply chain at the earliest phase and like yeah, giving motivation of all, all the participants of the economy to actually to try to wait and prolong until the lockdown is over, or we transform the economy, which is sustainable in the case of lockdown, if we have to say for, let's say, next like two years or five years, because we still don't know. Okay, thanks. So is your solution, which you have developed for this hackathon, is, is it now live and kicking? Are you kind of, was it developed only for the purpose of the hackathon, or, or do you plan to to go live with it and to keep so, it running. Yeah. So the hackathon was actually a good uh, exercise for our company to make things quicker inside, inside, our, inside, inside our house because the lending, especially for the SMEs, was always in our roadmap, the next thing to come. And the hackathon of the situation was a, it's a good opportunity for us to enter the market. So actually, I think we saved at least a couple of months by building a solution and we're expecting to be live in July. Uh, so the hackathon of the situation actually was a good pressure for, for us, for a company, for a team to focus and to deliver it quicker than we were planning naturally. Okay, okay, thanks. All right, so I guess uh, SME lending was one of the areas which uh, popped up during the crisis where, where fintechs could uh, innovate and develop their solutions. What else? Uh, Douglas, I mean, looking... You meet a lot of executives, you do a lot of, of interviews. What else do you see? Have you... Have, what? What sort of innovations or new business models, new products have you observed uh, during these uh, your meetings with with executives? Yeah. Um, so from my perspective, I, I guess it wouldn't really be so much as as new technology, rather finally putting in place existing technologies that maybe should have been leveraged um, a couple of years ago. I've seen a lot more um, impetus in cloud-based technologies. Um, and customer facing um, and customer experience technologies and fintechs coming forward. Um, and that's kind of pushed itself as well, I'd say, into a, a lot of the, the kind of smaller fintech banks as well. Um, Moving into uh, going back to the, the lending solution as well, we start. I've started to see um, a couple more fintech banks like uh, Varen Gold um, look into actually starting to create lending suites that are uh, that are far more capable and uh, based off cloud-based solutions and marketplaces um, that maybe should have been leveraged by some of the high street banks and and other fintechs earlier. Um, so I'd definitely say. From, from that perspective, cloud-based technologies and, and uh, machine learning, um, especially to 
to really mitigate some of the risk that the fact that numerous um, organizations around the world are now working from home, um, especially payment uh, or fintechs. Um, and so the KYC and a AML regulations, they still need to comply. So I think we're going to see a, a stronger um, kind of investment in terms of cloud-based technologies um, and, and KYC technologies. Okay, thanks. Kestuti, would you like to elaborate more on that? What, what are your observations? Yeah. <clears throat> Actually, it's, it's very interesting. If we are comparing the previous crisis, which was in year 2008, actually, mm -hmm. all the banks were blamed after that, that they built this, this crisis. Now the situation is quite, is quite difficult. Banks have a lot of liquidity and they are much more prepared, of course. Mm -hmm. But, but I see that in the nearest future, the banks will be judged um, by, by their actions. Uh, because now, mm -hmm. now we see the rise of overdrafts and, uh, and, and other fees for, for, for services, especially directed to those companies which are, which are in trouble, and especially SMEs. But SMEs... In, in previous times as well, uh, was was something that everybody were were talking about the SMEs as a segment, but nobody had right tools or right or right approach or how to serve those those SME companies. It was so quite a difficult actually actually segment in the in the market, and the same is now, especially when they face a lot of a lot of problems but um, if we talk about about the uh, readiness and preparedness towards um, a new crisis or this so current crisis yes all the all the fintechs and all those smaller companies are much more prepared from the organizational structures maybe from the mm -hmm. organization organizational part of their of their of their business so because they are Agile and they are fast and they have new, new mm -hmm. infrastructures, but they are lacking uh, um, trust maybe because we saw that uh, a lot of clients during the um, this current crisis moved back to to incumbent banks and to the safe haven because they 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 are still alive and they are big and they will not fail actually mm -hmm. so. Uh, we see this part uh, of 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 movement, and and when when it comes to innovations, we see a lot of interesting stuff. Actually, those small startups, of course, are jumped into the lending space, um, or helping governments to, to to deliver new funding packages and and etc. But um, but on the other hand, big players like like Amazon, Google now entering the same fintech space, and they are not targeting the banking sector. Actually, they will not become banks, mm. but they are going to become, and they are becoming actually now a new banking technology vendor, and there will be a dramatic shift in the coming years, I guess, that when Google, Amazon and others will start to provide, and they already are doing this, providing technology and platforms for banks. There is a very interesting topic to talk about these big players as well. Okay. Okay, thanks. So basically what I hear both of you saying that not so much groundbreaking new innovations but the rather acceleration of certain trends which existed before, right? But they were kind of accelerated during the crisis and maybe, you know, some, uh, some shortcuts were made and, and companies faster implemented their kind of ideas and, and technologies maybe in order to, well, protect themselves or to capitalize uh, during this, uh, this crisis, right? Definitely. Yes, right. Well, because uh, COVID crisis is, acts as a catalyzer. All the bad mm -hmm. ideas and not sustainable business model will f will fail and failing faster. And the good ideas and, and good sustainable business models uh, are going to, to rise mm -hmm. 
much faster okay. as before. Okay. But let's let's then explore this a little bit more. Uh, I mean, okay, not so many maybe groundbreaking new innovations, but then anyway, I think uh, it's noticeable that the market for fintech has kind of expanded a little bit, right? Okay, there are probably we have reached more unbanked people. Uh, you know, probably we have solved number of uh, issues in financial inclusion areas, right? Uh, you know, when people were forced to order groceries online or food online, uh, I think digital payments went uh, went up. Well, not so much maybe in volumes, but but actually new customers, new small businesses adopted uh, a lot uh, more of these uh, solutions. Would you agree? Yes, I would agree. But also like. I'd like to make another point. Okay. Uh, the point is like, I think like, as we all agree that like FinTech was already prepared for these circumstances, even they never thought about that. But like FinTech was ready for the lockdown and for social distancing uh, from the client perspective. But there's also another perspective in each business is the employees and back office. And I think like, at least like from my company's experience, and I think it's for all the companies, what was the biggest kind of challenge and the change in the, in the culture was actually the remote work okay. because FinTech was not the, the, the area in which you actually can uh, allow the remote work at like at high scale because of the security issues. So I think a lot of like essential cyber security things they have be, 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 have been done in the last three months just to enable the remote work. And I think that was kind of a main one of the main like innovation adoption of innovation to the fintech. Uh, no, not adopt, adopting the fintech or to the by the clients. Okay. So I think the keeper security and remote work and like that change that like now you companies will be more flexible to hire people in remote uh, locations in different offices, not like trying to have everyone house to have like this physical firewall, mm -hmm. physical protection. I think that's going to be also a change for Windows itself. Okay. So that's something what probably has changed for most of the companies over the last three months from back office. Yeah. All right, all right. Have we seen yeah, any agree. new... Douglas, would you like to comment more on that? So, I mean, um, I've got an example, actually, um, and I brought this up in an interview I had um, a couple of weeks ago. And um, it, talking about um, working from home has been so important for, for everyone. But um, it's really shown how the fintechs have actually succeeded more in better ways and more ways than a lot of other verticals. Um, I was speaking to a Mexican, um, Mexican fintech bank, CLAR. And they were able to um, completely put their entire company working from home within a day. And I think that's, that comes about because of, you know, people in fintech are typically very tech savvy. And as a result, they can action these far quicker than maybe many other variables. So if we are, you know, the topic of the panel is to discuss how well fintech has done. Just from that anecdote alone, I think that's, you know, a good um, sign showing how flexible these fintech banks at least can be, despite maybe some of the other larger fintech banks like Monzo, for instance, struggling yeah. with, to kind of mitigate the fact that they mitigate their scale and how far they had come in the time period um, over the last half a decade, for instance, um, to where they are now, um, shows that potentially they are more. They've almost become like a, a legacy bank in, in a regard, um, which is yeah, unfortunate. But you know, obviously, I, I think it, it shows uh, you know the fact that the fintech banks have done uh, done pretty well there. Okay. That, that brings us to maybe slightly different question, slightly off topic, but, but Jesper, I wonder if you could um, um, help me to, to understand. So, you know, before the COVID crisis, money was kind of pouring into the fintech industry. It was enough to have a fintech uh, written somewhere. Um, Okay, uh, pouring into the um, fintech industry, but uh, now the situation is um, uh, now the situation is uh, what I hear different. We've seen a trend already slightly before the crisis that both volumes and number of deals. Um, 
uh, in the fintech industry was going down. Now, I wonder how this COVID-19 crisis will affect investors' um, mindset. And um, Jesper, would you say that in the future we will see less of the fintech startups and only those who have already developed substantial customer base and, and probably have uh, uh, sufficient income will survive? No, I think um, I think uh, as uh, as you were also just talking about uh, just before I fell out. But um, uh, what has really what has really happened uh, in this? What I find uh, as a dramatic change is the, not only has market share has uh, changed in terms of consumer loans, etc. But um, it might not be many percentages that we're talking about now. But it, it's really a dramatic change in terms of uh, tendency, and especially in terms of trust. Um, as you also talked about this. Um, symptomatic change of now suddenly it is uh, politically correct with uh, remote work, which was uh, before COVID-19. It was something exotic for us in, in fintech, maybe, but uh, for the general consumer, it was, um, and, uh, you know, in B2B, it was something that was considered um, uh, not not normal. And uh, suddenly now it is normal. This trust to fintech and uh, other uh, entities um, has really, has really changed. Uh, so that means that um, with the manifestation of market shares with the change of uh, uh, behavior um, and uh, uh, you will see that uh, this this will drive more investment into fintech for sure um, personally I'm looking at uh, more maybe maybe long term um, opportunities um, such as where do we see the next credit bureaus uh, popping up? Um, and, uh, um, you know, I, I see it both in Asia and um, in Europe and, and U.S. tendencies to, to data-driven um, uh, businesses which uh, are, are fighting to take that space. And uh, I just think that this has really given uh, a, a further strength to um, what uh, before might have been generally known investor crazy, you know, investor circles that um, you know fintech uh, is still to come, and I think with COVID nineteen, it is here. Okay, thanks. Thank Can I um, follow on from that? Sure, Douglas. Just in terms of the um, uh, following on from uh, just was uh, talk about trust. Um, I actually got sent a study earlier today. Uh, literally today, uh, which was uh, brilliant for me, shall I say. Um, but uh, within the study, they found that um, a lot of technology companies had found that by working from home uh, religiously and unanimously, they'd found an increase um, of a rise of productivity in software development of 30% um, within their organization. Um, and I mean, that is a huge, huge increase um, in three months. Um, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of other organizations and a lot of other industries and verticals would be jealous of that. Um, the one thing that they did find um, is that new software, um, a big kind of releases, suddenly became a lot harder to do. Um, but it was uh, what I found really interesting was that, that notion of trust and the fact that people didn't have to commute or spend energy going to various different places or interacting with other people, being distracted by other people, led to this 30% increase um, in, in software development times. Um, so I, I think that certainly uh, was a really interesting stat I pulled. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. So... Uh... So it sounds uh, optimistic, I would say, what, what you guys are saying, that uh, we should not see any freeze of funding for fintechs in the future due to the, due to the crisis, but rather on the contrary, probably this, uh, this area is very attractive and as it develops, it will attract continuous investment. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, maybe a question to V Totas. Uh, you know, you are a fintech company. Um, what sort of um, opportunities you still see in the current situation or kind of you maybe 
have certain regret that you have missed. Maybe, you know, if you knew that this would continue for another half a year, this lockdown, would you do something different in your company? Would you, would you go into certain new product areas, new partnerships? I think regarding the product roadmap, I think it would be more or less the same because still like the things you want to do quicker, but just because you have a bottleneck of development and so on, you cannot make faster. But I think uh, regarding the remote work and the office culture, but I think like, like especially like this beginning of this year, we had a lot of like, kind of, how to say, the efforts put on the finding new office and so on. And like when we had the, the lockdown, we eventually found out that like it was just like a more or less a waste of time because we actually work, uh, are also working much more efficiently from from home because we, as I say, we have more less office drama because usually when you office you have like small things, you have like you know something is missing from the kitchen, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. And then when everyone's working at home, you actually are more work focused, and I think people are happier because they can spend more time with family, so on. Because I think like you, you want to spend your time with your colleagues professionally, but usually they, they shouldn't, they're not, not, you're not always seeing them your best friends. So actually having this mix when you have like a coffee break with your family, with your kids, but you actually you have your professional environment with people who are very competent and you can just switch on, in your, in your, on, your, on, your, on your computer and just lock in your room. Mm -hmm. And then you can just leave in one second back to your family. I think that's, that's actually what empowers people and makes mm -hmm. them love the job more and makes mm -hmm. them more effective. Okay. On the other hand, yes, I think like what, what the opportunity which was probably missed by us, but just missed because of the, you cannot do everything in one, in one mm -hmm. day, it's actually more about focusing about online payments and payment processing because the lockdown was actually a huge, huge potential for the new e-commerce and so on. Especially in March and April, we saw a lot of mm. uh, e -shop, uh, shops getting online and getting online in, let's say, very old school ways when we're just taking orders on Facebook and then we're, we're trying to build the e-shops in parallel and which are rolling down now. So I think yeah. that was yeah. one of the opportunities we missed. Okay, I see, thanks. I'll take one question from the audience. So um, the question is as follows, that uh, most innovations, especially tools which help dealing with COVID-19, need a lot of data. Have you noticed any progress in opening up or providing more data across Europe and other regions? Kestuti, maybe you'd like to Actually, take that. Actually, yes, and there are a lot of examples, actually. I, I still remember it was almost a month ago, maybe, when NASA uh, launched uh, a new hackathon, Space Apps, uh, which was dedicated to COVID, um, to COVID uh, crisis and problems, and, and all the developers and all the all the teams who who participated uh, were using the open data from NASA uh, and they opened a lot of APIs and they allowed to access all the data all the data th they have but when it comes to uh, other providers or for example now I I've already mentioned uh, Google but Google who, is becoming a platform a front-end and technological vendor for banks Mm. around the world because they know everything about the customers and you can and leveraging this front end and leveraging their ai capabilities machine learning capabilities and um, and the knowledge about the customers you can provide intimate actually very hyper personalized products products in the future. Mm -hmm. So this uh, opening of data is happening uh, from different directions and from different angles, starting from open banking initiative, which is taking uh, momentum in Europe and ending with additional data like NASA and, and, and plant platformication uh, when we talk about um, Amazon, Google, and etc. And everywhere is data behind, actually. It's the air for, for, for financial institutions and new financial services. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe somebody else would like to comment on that? Jesper, Douglas? Yes, um, if I may, um, I think it's sure. uh, it's a natural. Um, I think it's a natural evolution uh, with the um, uh, access to, to more access to data. I think uh, the uh, in this this consciousness that is uh, has been driven uh, in 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 our behavior, you know, through we're basically turning uh, the new limitations into a new uh, minimal living, and uh, with a focus on on on, on 
the positive side of uh, what uh, is, is really a, a, a challenging um, change. But for the millennials, this is, you know, they, 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 this is normal. And um, uh, also for millennials, it's, you know, it comes with blockchain, the whole open source tendency. I think, um, I think this, this, it's, it's the, the data, openness with the data is, is, is natural. And it's, it's, it's really one of the great things that uh, COVID-19 has driven through societies. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, we have one more question uh, to Vito Tas. Uh, you mentioned some of the cybersecurity issues and solutions, uh, and the question asks: Could you could you specify some? So what I meant, that mainly reflected to the remote work, so it reflected to the virtual private networks infrastructure, especially like enabling the second factor authentication for employees who are logging to the system, as well as the monitoring of the actions of the employees on internal system. So it's more or less about the, the security measures, which most companies and we had before that, but we're not uh, using them at, let's say, the full capacity because the, like, the, the potential risk was smaller than having like, all the employees, special employees who are working with sensitive data, working remotely. So it's more or less about kind of uh, fixing the infrastructure to its maximum potential. Mm -hmm. And what, what I meant by that technology is more or less about the having the secure second factor certificators for remote work, so you actually know that it's your employee who's signing off or somebody else. Okay, okay, thanks. Probably that, that brings us to maybe another interesting topic uh, uh, from regulatory perspective. Of course, there are already a lot of um, rules and regulations, directives on, on financial industry, right? But I think this uh, COVID-19 crisis brought up a new um, or refreshed the the question about the, you know um, contingency planning uh, things like you know like you mentioned now working from home and having full access to your um, uh, systems and and probably that would uh, bring another wave of regulatory if not new regulations, but then at least checkups on, on the fintech industry from regulatory perspective. Douglas, would you like to comment yeah. on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's an, <laughs> an example of that, um, that that came about within just because of the pandemic. And um, the SCA regulation or the strong uh, strong customer authentication regulation that was going to um, take place back in May, um, the FCA um, over in the UK actually delayed it um, because it was going to put unnecessary strain, security strain on uh, retail businesses in the UK during a time where they've all been told to shut up their bricks and mortar stores. And um, so, I mean, that's an example of regulatory flexibility um, that has come about because of the um, the pandemic, whereas it was going to become stricter and, and uh, have stronger authentication. They've actually um, decided to postpone it until stores can, can actually reopen. Um, so I think that, that's actually quite interesting where you would assume that the regulations would become stricter. Um, they've actually, well, they're not going to be uh, relaxed. They're, they're just uh, certainly waiting until the, the pandemic is over. Um, but I, I assume that there may be... Um, movements in terms of online payments and, and you're certainly still um i believe the the verdict on whether the the transformation from target to payment um over in europe from the, the central bank of europe i think and swift is going to be made um some point this month so that will be really interesting to see if, if those payment um, um that if that, that that changes okay okay thanks let me take one more question, probably the last question from the audience, and then we will slowly move to the conclusions. So, it um, seems that what we are discussed so far looks kind of positive for the fintech industry. So now we are asked to name what was the negative for the fintechs during this COVID crisis. What, uh, 
what was negative impact. Negative. Well, for example, when we talk about the fintech, <laughs> when we talk about financial technologies, there are a lot of areas where financial technology payments and etc. Are, are embedded into other businesses. For example, uh, in the in the retail stores, which mm -hmm. are uh, available in, in different countries or so small small shops, convenience stores, and etc. When uh, during the lockdown, they lost almost all the customers because they were not able to go online, uh, even. Taking, taking into account that, for example, our customer in Finland, he has more than 1,000 electronic products inside every single store. You can buy physical goods, but also over more than 1,000 um, e-products, like replenishment of iTunes accounts, bill payments, applications for passports, railway mm -hmm. tickets, and etc. But when they lost this, uh, this stream of, of bypassers in these stores, okay. the, it, it was a negative impact actually in technologi technologically advanced retail. Okay. Any it's, more? It's, it's just one of the examples. Any more negative examples? Well, I mean, backing yes, up that uh, point, I, I believe... Oh, sorry, yes, but you go. Go ahead, Doug. Well, I, I was just, um, yeah, just uh, backing up that that belief and i think mckinsey uh, mckinsey's um, global payment uh, report re uh, reported that there will be an 8 to 10% uh, spending decrease um worldwide um which i mean is is going to dramatically um affect obviously lots of retailers but also a lot of the fintechs that were facilitating these um these payments which had become a, a we often talk about the movement from large batch payments to uh, low value, but um, uh, low value but high volume payments. And obviously, when people aren't paying anymore, um, that's a significant profit margin that's going to affect uh, not just retailers but fintechs alike. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes and I think um, yeah, the the uncertainty <clears throat> uh, was really bad for everybody, also for fintech. Um, fear paralyzes. And um, we've seen uh, a lot of delays. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of investment, uh, that uh, people just, just suddenly did not see how the world would um, evolve. And uh, in, in, in a lot of circumstances, uh, we have lost negotiations, we've lost opportunities because uh, we did not really know what was going on, in spite of the fact that we... Um, that the capital is available and uh, people are ready to move uh, because of this uncertainty, uh, both in terms of seller and buyer, uh, everything just uh, stagnates uh, because of the uncertainty and the fear that, it, um, that, that, that this whole pandemic has generated. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, now I'd like to do a quick round and... Um, ask from all of you some closing remarks what are your main conclusions and takeaways you know starting with Vito Tas. yeah actually i will also like add like another one more angle of a fintech and like the effect in parallel with covid because what we see especially in the united states because also another part of fintech is the investments and the uh, apps which allows the retail, retail people to invest and then we also saw the benefits for people in us for not having a job for unemployment benefits which are even higher than wages mm. and that's more or less still anecdotal evidence but i think like it will go to actually a new story when like people getting their help of their money actually in even investing in the bankrupt companies and so on so you are having like people without investment knowledge, uh, diverse, like putting the, fun, the money back to the stock market. And I think there's going to be also another effect of this pandemic, which we will study probably after one year or two years. The best example would be like the Robin Hood uh, users having the, buying the shares in Hertz, which has already bankrupted. Mm -hmm. So it's something phenomenal. And like when the bankrupt company is issuing the shares after, uh, like after the bankruptcy. So it's something also phenomenal. And I think it's also due to the fintech, due to the easy access to the markets. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it also has like a negative e effect in general. Okay. Okay. So I think okay. we're still at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's pretty hard to conclude the actual impact for it. But okay. I, think it's, I think it was still anyway, it was a good stir in the cup when we actually so we will come, we will come wiser and prepared for, for even worse conditions. Okay, thank you. Kestuti, what's yeah. your... Okay, my <coughs> 
I would tell that uh, now it is it was a very good exercise and, and especially a very good uh, background now to, for the future to choose for every fintech and, and for every new financial institution or financial institution which wants to remain afloat actually to choose the right partners the right tools mm -hmm. to to move uh, and digitally transform the businesses. Stop talking, but just start start doing this. Because if you are not uh, changing, then you will die. You will die in the future. And I personally just wait and believe a lot that one day the or semantic web and semantic banking, the banking and web with the conscience uh, behind will emerge finally, mm -hmm. finally, and we will have this uh, smart web and all the smart and hyper-personalized banking applications and, and real approach towards me instead of having those uh, just banking products. I want to live my life and just don't think about the banking, <laughs> banking products. I want to see this embedded. Uh, invisible banking services, okay. which complements my life. Okay, so you're hoping for major transformation here? Yeah, sure. Okay, okay thanks. Uh, Douglas, what are, what are your final comments and conclusions? Um, I guess mine are, are slightly more negative. Uh, but basically, <laughs> I think that the... Uh, in my in my opinion, the uh, the virus has caused um, a lot of uh, what was going to be collaborative approaches between the fintechs and the large institutions, the banks, um, has actually been scuttled. I think a lot of um, banks are going to actually look at trying to maybe um, work on themselves up from the inside, and uh, this might actually. Um, might slow down a lot of the the more exciting innovation that we were going to have seen, um, and actually maybe have a more grounded approach over the last, you know, mm -hmm. more so than the last couple of years. We might see shrinking um, from a lot of maybe some of the more successful players that we'd seen really hit quite ex you know exciting heights. Um, but hopefully, at the end of the day, it will mean that banking services are more effective, and uh, hopefully, in, in the long run, it will actually be a positive. Jesper, what about you? What yeah. are your thoughts? Yes, I think um, as a conclusion for the innovation and the changes that we've had after this uh, pandemic, I think um, one of the absolute uh, uh, most positive things that I've seen is that people have for years been discussing and been tired of the hysteria of the traditional stock exchange. Um, and we see now that uh, during this period, uh, 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 capital has actually been invested into uh, alternative asset exchanges. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, talking about uh, things that was very, very, that was limited to, to very few people, um, like uh, fine and rare wine, um, where, where you've seen capital being because of the uncertainty of the pandemic and how, how are we going to get out of the lockdown? Is this a crisis for a year or is it five years? You know, that people were looking to put serious capital, to, capital into uh, alternative assets, which in, in good traditional investment strategies, maybe before was 2%, 1%. And suddenly what uh, was augmented, uh, where people were taking serious risk and putting long-term commitment to alternative assets and new exchanges in alternative assets for, uh, I mean, five to ten years. This is very, very interesting, and I think it's healthy. Um, and I think um, and I think this, this uh, lack of trust uh, that is in the traditional stock exchange is just not going to come back immediately. You know, this is a great opportunity for FinTech as well. Thank you very much. So, to summarize, I, I think the my, my main takeaway from this is that maybe we have not seen major innovations, maybe we have not seen new products coming up, but definitely we have seen extension and expansion of fintech market. And um, that's the main conclusion. So, I thank you very much, guys, for being here. Uh, with with us today. Thank you, Thank you, Jesper, us. Douglas, Kostutis, Vitutas. It's been a pleasure, and um, good luck. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Be good.